Okay, so let's talk a little bit about fatigue and the influence of the different energy systems on that fatigue. So what I wanted to show you all today, I was, I was looking at this graph um, earlier this week with my grad students, and I thought it would be perfect for what we are talking about, actually. Okay, so on this graph, we are going to have velocity on this axis, and over here, we are going to have various lengths of track events. Okay, we're gonna start with 100 meter, and then 200, and then we're gonna go all the way up to the marathon, and we're going to fill in, in between, what we think the average velocity was for each of these events for the current world records, okay? And we'll just do, uh, we'll do the men's, but know that the women's follow almost the same exact trend, okay? Um, so for the average velocity in the 100 meters, does anybody know what that might be? It's kind of easy to calculate because it's 100 meters, right? And so if we're thinking in meters per second, and does anyone know roughly around the time? Second. 10 meters per second, roughly, yeah, because uh, in, in, let's say, the Olympic finals, you're going to see everyone, oh gosh, <laughs> can we close that? Thanks, Alexia. Uh, we're going to see everyone dipping under 10 seconds, right, for the men. So let's put, this is going to be 10, and we'll say this is velocity in meters per second, okay? So for the 100, it's going to be about here. Is it going to be faster or slower for the 200? Because it's twice as long, okay? Is it going to be faster or slower? Slower. That's what we would think, right? And it was kind of a gotcha, a gotcha question. Is that how we say it? It was a trick question. Uh, because actually, in the 200, what we see is that the average time is faster. Isn't that crazy? But it's faster because in the 200, they've already had time to get up to their maximum velocity and then hold it for much longer. Whereas in the 100, much more of that race, a greater percentage, is acceleration. Starting from zero to get up to top speed. And then they burn all their gas and then try to hold that as long as possible. In the 200, there is this slight, ever so slight bit of pacing going on. You know, not a lot, because they're still going very fast and accelerating as fast as they can. It's the difference between going 100% the entire time versus accelerating up to maybe 98% and then really turning it on at the end. And they are able to hit faster velocities, okay? So the next event we're gonna talk about is a 400. I'll write it down here. And is, that's now twice as long as the 200. Which way do we think it's going to go? Down, because how many of you have run an all out 400? And how many of you know that as soon as you hit that 200 meter mark, halfway through, and you've already been sprinting all out? Oh gosh, this is the longest 200 meters you'll ever run. Well, unless you run the 800. And then that's the longest 200 meters you'll ever run. OK, so it's going to be a little bit lower, um, around like 9.2 or 9.3 or something like that, OK? Now, as we go further out in the events, let's say 800, 1500, 5K, all right? 800, 15, 5K. And for those who don't think metrically and didn't run track, half a mile nearly a mile, 3.1 miles, okay? Is it going down? Yes, that's an obvious one. How steeply is it going to go down? What do we think, what is the average velocity in let's say a mile run and a 5K for the world record? Does anyone know? Let's say right here is five. Is it north of five meters per second or south of that? Faster or slower than that? Faster than that, yes, yeah? Okay, anyone know what the mile world record is? It's um, 343.13, and boy, there are some athletes knocking on the door of that 343. Some who are, maybe were capable in the right conditions of hitting it this year. Uh, very, very fast. Okay, so the average velocity is going to be, starting at the 800, 7.9, then 7.3, then all the way down to 6.6 .6 meters per second, okay? So 7.9, 7.3, and then all the way down to 6.6 .6 meters per second. But I kind of drew this not really to scale, because if we're thinking about distance, if this was an actual plot of distance, where's the 5K going to be? It's going to be way out here closer to the marathon, right? And really, the marathon should be farther out. So let's put this here. 
like that. So if we were to actually graph this right now, we, to connect these dots, it's going to be something like that. All right. If we're looking for a line of best fit, then it's going to plummet down like this okay, and start to level off. Because what's the average speed in the marathon world record? Does anyone know what the marathon world record is? It's been, it's been set and reset a lot recently. Yeah, so, so technically that, that breaking two one didn't count as a world record for the marathon because there were all kinds of um, uh, pacers and help that were not necessarily sanctioned for a race. It was more an attempt to see what was physiologically possible. So the actual world record in the marathon is two flat and 35 seconds. So two hours and 35 seconds um, set by uh, Kelvin Kiptum, who unfortunately, uh, I think he passed away. He was hit by a car. Yeah, it was in a car. Yeah, so tragic because he, like, gosh, d just to imagine what he could have done, such a, such a rising athlete um, and so young too. But so, so too flat, and the pace of that is going to be around 5.7, 5.8 meters per second. Okay, so way out here for the marathon, well, it should be slightly higher given my out out of scale graph okay way out here and so if we were to extrapolate there it is and if we went ultra marathon we would see that this line is is going down but not very steeply okay so now we're examining this graph we're seeing distance here velocity here and we have these three different trend lines okay goes up comes down sharply then goes down much more gradually okay now Think about what you just learned about the three energy systems, okay? And we, uh, on the quiz, and w when we were discussing some of those questions, we were starting to get to it a little bit, all right? Now, the PCR system, the phosphocreatine system, and your body's innate stores of ATP, your innate stores of ATP can last you about two to four seconds, depending on who you are, how much muscle mass, how trained you are, okay? So they don't last very long. You have to start replenishing it right away. And that's where the phosphocreatine system comes in. But how long does that last? Phosphocreatine system. Yeah, maybe up to 15 seconds if you're well-trained. Um, and maybe if you're slightly not going all out. Maybe you're going 97% or something like that. Um, so not very long. Definitely less than 20 seconds, right? And so when we hit the 200-meter mark in a, an all-out race, those men and women are running uh, you know, most of them at the elite level, under 22 seconds for the women, under 21 seconds for the men. Okay, so that's like PCR system right there. That's a perfect race for that system. It's like a test of that system, maybe. Except for that, we have a lot of research now, especially by Dr. Wayand and his team. I'll try to post some of it on Canvas, showing that the limitations in the 100 and the 200, the thing that limits your speed, is actually not metabolic factors. It's not your ability to generate ATP. It's your ability to generate force. How strong, powerful, and quick is the athlete? And I say strong, powerful, quick, and what I mean is ability to uh, produce force. Powerful is force times velocity, right, or work over time. So how quickly can you get that work done? And then when I say quickness, um, that's more of a lay term, but what I'm wanting to describe is the ground contact of their foot hitting the ground, how long does your foot spend on the ground, and in that length of time, can you generate sufficient force? Okay, so think about someone who's plodding along and they're not a great sprinter. Like if I was to get out right now and start sprinting, you would hear clomp, clomp, clomp. Whereas if you go to a track meet and you see someone coming out of the blocks in their sprint race, you're going to hear that, 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 a very short and sharp sound. And a good coach can actually hear if an athlete is fatigued or not based on the sound of his foot striking the ground, which is really cool. So the less time your foot spends on the ground and the more force you produce, typically all of the things considered, you're gonna be a faster athlete. So we're not limited here metabolically, which is why you double the distance, but you still get a faster velocity, okay? But now you've exhausted your PCR system, okay? Now, after you've exhausted that, and remember these are not all like only PCR, only anaerobic glycolysis, only oxidative. They're all ebbing and flowing, but it's more of an emphasis on each of these pathways, okay? So you've exhausted that system, and the body now at these longer distances needs to rely on a greater percentage of anaerobic glycolysis. Now, there is actually a lot of new research showing that um, at the 1500 meter mark, 
that's already going to be about 70%, maybe more, 70% aerobic. Okay, even though it's a middle distance event, it's more aerobic than anaerobic. But anaerobic still plays a huge part in it, and it's probably, or it is rather, the leading cause of fatigue. Okay, bless you. So when we think about what happens when we use the anaerobic glycolysis system, what is the uh, primary way that we fatigue with that system? Okay, think about generation of ATP from glucose, okay, using anaerobic glycolysis. So when we get to pyru pyruvate, what happens? Is it shuttled to the mitochondria or is it converted to lactate? It's converted to lactate, right? So when I ask you, what is the primary fatigue consequence of anaerobic glycolysis, immediately in your mind you should be thinking lactate. Lactate production, which lactate is actually good. It's used as fuel, especially by the heart. We can um, uh, reabsorb it, and it's, it's actually like a, a form of energy, but a byproduct of lactate are those hydrogen ions, which is why we sometimes call it lactate, lactic acid, okay? Um, so lactic acid production and some other metabolites build up and they cause your muscles to not contract as efficiently. And that's the fatigue. And it creates a burning sensation and that demotivates you from running faster. And even if you wanted to, which you know, most, most athletes do, they try to push through it, you seize up in ways that are hard to imagine unless you've been there before, okay? There's, there are phrases such as like, the bear jumped on my back, right? Uh, which is what it actually feels like. You're running and all of a sudden, you hit that peak lactate, you can't contract your muscles, your stride shortens, you start like really gritting it out. People, some people throw their heads back, I used to do that sometimes, and, uh, and you just cannot go faster. You actually slow dramatically, which is one reason potentially why we have such a dramatic slope as we incre increase in distance. Does this make sense? We have to dramatically reduce the average velocity from 400 to 800 to 1500 to 5K because Lactate accumulation is going to be the thing that uh, slows those elite athletes. Now, those of us normal people right now who are untrained, probably there's other factors that are gonna slow us down, but if you were highly, highly trained for whatever your genetic disposition is, if you train for one of these events very well, then the limitation for you is going to be lactate accumulation. So this makes sense? Now, that's the first two trends that we see. This, the last trend, this long, slow tail, Right now, think about the oxidative system and how it is a very slow rate of ATP production, but a huge, huge capacity of ATP production, which is why once we hit this speed, for elites, for elite distance runners, this is about the speed that they can sustain using oxidative processes below that lactate threshold. Okay, if you're below the lactate threshold, now you're using oxidation, um, you're clearing all the lactate, so that's not building up you're getting all of your ATP aerobically, all right? So if you go longer and longer and longer, there are fewer and fewer and fewer metabolic consequences for you. And as you fatigue, yes, you're still going to fatigue, right? M loss of muscle glycogen, um, your muscles are taking on eccentric damage, um, a host of other factors that are not coming to my head off the top of my head right now, but you're still gonna fatigue, right? You still can't go quite as fast in an ultra marathon as a marathon. Oh, fueling becomes a huge issue, replenishment of those substrates. Uh, but that's why we see such a long tail. Make sense? Yeah? So in summary, creatine phosphate system, lasting about 20 seconds. We're not limited in these events metabolically. We're limited by force production. Anaerobic glycolysis, Lactate is one of the primary drivers of fatigue and a dramatic slowing of average velocity in the world record times at these distances. And then in distances above the 5K and stretching out to the marathon, uh, more and more it becomes the oxidative system, which is a high capacity but a low rate of ATP production. Cool, what questions do you have? <laughs>